Austin. Welcome to Rock Book Show. And joining me today is repeat offender, Karen Rose. How are you, Karen? I'm good. I'm good. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Well, Karen's first book was B-Sides and Broken Heart, which we talked about last year. Amazing book. And now she has a new one, a, a travel log, a um, fun escapades of an American Springsteen fan in Europe, and it is called Raise Your Hand. Congratulations. It's really fun. Thank you. Thank you. It was really a lot of fun to write, too. Okay. Now, did you plan the trip first, or did you say, there's a book in this, maybe I should take the trip? Um, I've been thinking about trying to write a book for a while, like some sort of like lengthy travelogue about seeing Springsteen, and just never had enough shows together. And also, it's not really exotic to be like, hey, I just flew into Omaha, now I'm in a car driving to Kansas City. It's, it's not quite... Like, that's been done. Europe is a whole different thing. I'd never seen Bruce in Europe. I'd seen other bands in Europe. So we planned it, and I said, yeah, I think I'm going to write this book. And I thought I would actually write the book while we were in Europe or, like, on the plane. And didn't. And now, if you've read the book, you realize there was, like, no free time to do anything, including sleep. So you saw how many shows in how many days? Um, we saw seven shows in five cities, and it was 16 days. Wow. Yeah. And you tried to put in sightseeing in between right, there. Right, 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 right. We thought we thought we would be able to do that, and I don't recommend that to anyone. Don't, don't do that. Yeah. Besides being a really fun um, chronicling of your adventures at the concerts themselves, you put in the set list and the encores and all the great stuff. It's also a great trip advisor book. So anybody planning a trip to Europe to any of these given cities, great advice from Karen Rose. I like the way you structured the book. Did you have that in mind too before you left? No, I did not have that in mind before I left. Um, I had actually, I'm trying to think, I had originally wanted to just put the, sh the, the, the non-show stuff separate from the show stuff, and I did that and it didn't work. So then I put it back together and I, I think it flowed, I think it flowed a lot better. Yeah, and one of the fun things you did too was you took a little coffee break French. <laughs> I have downloaded that program myself. Did it help at all? Yeah, it totally <laughs> helped. Because I mean, I took French, so it's not like I, I don't know any French. Like I don't know how well that would have worked if I'd never learned a word of French in my life. But I studied French in high school and college, so so at least I had I, I had some basis, and it, it really did help. Most of the time, people spoke to us in French, and even when we like, st I was stumbling over it. They would still talk to me in slower French. So I was like, success. We did that. That's good. They didn't think I was an American. And you had amazing seats or amazing positioning for each show. How did you manage that? Well, in Europe, they do this thing with with a, a queue and numbers and a roll call where you show up and you get a number on your hand and you come back every three to four hours and check in. You can't miss a check-in. And this is how they do it in Europe. They started doing it over here, but over here we have insurance and liability and nobody wants to take responsibility for it. And, and unofficially, you know, we've heard that the promoter said to Springsteen's people like, Either you manage this or you can't play in our venues because we can't have people camping a week ahead of time. And yet an American guy named Ted was keeper of the flame over there in one queue, right? God, it was, it was, you know, we get to Paris and we're looking for the gate and I see this guy head to toe stone pony, stone pony hat, stone pony t-shirt, stone pony jacket. And I'm like, okay, it's some idiot from New Jersey. And I'm like, where's the GA line? And he says, he looks at me and he panics. And, and I don't know what language he spoke, but he, and, and of course, I don't wear Springsteen stuff. So You're not that guy. I'm not that guy. <laughs> and it's not like he could tell that that what I wanted. And I, I guess something, and he was like, oh, gate 27. So I go walking over to gate 27 and I'm looking for somebody with a clipboard or looks like they're running a line and I'm asking people in every possible language and finally somebody understands and points and a guy's writing on his clipboard, writing on his clipboard and we go over and he looks up and he's like, hey! And I'm like, Ted? He's like, I was the first person here. Uh, you, I got here on Saturday. I beat the French. And I'm like, hi, Ted. <laughs> I want to ask you about the signs because I had to tell you, when I go to a show, I'm like, I don't have time to make a sign. Does anybody really care about the sign? But the signs are kind of important over there. The signs are almost more important there than they are here in a way because if you only get to see Bruce once a tour because he's not coming to Prague or Sunderland, or, you know, more than once a tour and you want to hear a song, um, it, people put a lot of thought into the signs. There were also a lot of really funny signs I saw too. Like pe they have... They're more irreverent 
it, it, while they really love him, they're almost a little, they, they can laugh at themselves about it. Like there was a series of signs these two girls of Norway, from Norway made, it was like, play, um, play this sign and then he flipped it over and says you're not going to play it though are you and then her friend had a sign that said you pussy and <laughs> and it i really appreciated that i mean like one of the there were some other girls from norway that had a sign about the higgs boson because they were very proud of it they were from the town i it was just it was just really way more interesting than play my play my play born to run it's my birthday right you talk about this in the book, which I thought was really interesting. There is the myth that European fans are better fans or something, but you, you talk about that he's seen differently over there. Tell me about what you what you think. Well, there's a couple of things. They they don't they don't expect him to be what he was in 1978 because nobody over there was seeing him in 1978. So that nobody can take there can't be any like fan one a uh, one uh, one upmanship. Like you know, there's a guy that years ago told me I can't possibly take your opinion seriously because you didn't see him in 1975. Are you kidding me? No, seriously, are you kidding me? And, and, and so so there's there's that. Then there's the just they're younger, so people are going to the show not they're not going to the show to relive their misspent youth. They're, they they like what he's doing. They like what he's doing now. They like the new songs. They don't see the new songs as punishment they have to sit through to get to the old songs. You know, they're very they're very interested in his history, and, and it's not like they're not interested in the old songs, but but they just they it's not that they don't love him and they don't love him irrationally and they won't get into an argument that the Vienna show was the best show ever in the history of the world when. A confidential source after we wrote a less than stellar review of Vienna we heard through back channel that yeah a lot of people actually felt that way so but but you know so, which is what you'll get here if you dare to say that the show in uh, I don't know State College was not the best show ever in the history of the world because anyway they're they, they they have more to lose and yet they have less to lose and it's it's just it's just interesting. It's just an interesting perspective, I think. Yeah, and I really like too, I found it interesting that you said that they're younger. They are definitely younger. It's a younger, it's a more inclusive feeling. I definitely noticed this when I went to uh, the shows in Philly, which were my first shows back in the States. And it's not, you know, a bunch of 50-something white guys standing there with their arms folded waiting for proof at 78. They're they're energetic. They move. They dance. They sing. They have. They have fun. Like there's a lot more unselfconscious fun being had. And you know what? There are there are people who will be super. And, and, and again, I don't want to canonize these guys because there are plenty of fans that will be obnoxious and shut you out. But then you know you're gonna have some like guys from Spain who like notice you're singing along and they put their arms around you and you're part of their group and it's. It's a lighter feeling. It's a more inclusive feeling, I think. That's very cool. And you were at the Hyde Park show, which I would say was the show that definitely got the most international press because of Paul McCartney and the power situation. So what really went down? Well, so so everyone, this is interesting because we were in the front row for Hyde Park, and, and it really was, a lot of people love that chapter. Um, because it was, it was the one where I really sort of blew out the whole experience. Um, and you know, we were in the, we, we got there, we, we hadn't planned on being that close, but we ended up with a good number and we ran, we, I trained for this. I literally, I literally trained, I literally, if you go on to Google Maps and you look at Hyde Park and you look at the, 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 you know, the, the, the satellite view, it's set up from Hyde, it's set up for Hard Rock Calling from previous year. So we could see what the distance was from the ticket tent to the stage. Now it's not exact because it's still a little different now, but I was like, okay, I need to be able to run that distance comfortably. And just in general, we knew it was going to be pretty physically trying, but that was sort of my goal. Not a marathon. It was, can I run from the gates at Hyde Park to the front of the stage? And beat everybody else. So we were in the front and we noticed that they were not running exactly on time. I mean, it's a festival. Festivals don't generally run on time. But, I, you know, at this point, we know who the various members of Roos's crew are and what they do and what their role is. And these guys are super professional and they, they, they never look rushed. They never look hurried. These guys were running around the stage like crazy. And they were trying, it was clear that there was something wrong with the teleprompter. At least that's what, I don't know, but that is the thing they were messing with. And the people that were messing with it were the guys that take care of the teleprompter. 
And as soon as they fixed it, like as soon as they were like, it works, Bruce came on stage and started. So that was clearly what they were waiting for. But it was only 20 minutes late. It wasn't an hour. It wasn't an hour and a half. It wasn't Bruce was, oh, I don't feel like going on stage now. I want another cup of tea. Um, so the other thing is, when we got back to the hotel, all these people were indignant that they pulled the plug on Paul McCartney. And I'm on Twitter going, what are you talking about? I was just there. They did not pull the plug on Paul McCartney. And then other people were like, well, actually what happened was they had these relay towers, because it's a huge park. And they had speakers in the back. They had different, you know, three sets of speakers. They cut the ones in the back first. Then they cut the ones that are close, and they cut it at the stage last. So from my perspective, Paul McCartney had already left. Paul McCartney was done. The song had finished. And the only reason we knew something was wrong was that Bruce was trying to talk into the mic and it wasn't working. And Monty, who's his monitor guy, came out and went like this to him. And he was like, wow, they really did cut me off. And we could hear some of it because we were close. Yeah. But, and then I thought, oh, well, there's just a problem and they're going to fix it. Right. And then Monty's like, no, they, they pulled the plug. And so, so Paul, and Paul McCartney again had already left the stage, so it wasn't to us. They didn't pull it in the middle of, of Twist and Shout. Um, so that that's my, so I'm not indignant the way a, a lot of people are like that. You weren't don't sound very upset. I'm like I wasn't upset because it was a great show. Paul McCartney had just walked out. I had just seen a Beatles sing Beatles a Beatles songs with Bruce in London, and. And what was going to be next was probably going to be 10th Avenue Freeze Out. And I feel bad for everyone in London who didn't get to see it. But Bruce, and Bruce should have probably put it up earlier in the show instead of the last song if Paul McCartney was going to come out. But it, again, and, and you know what? It was, it was stupid. It was really stupid. And we'll never really know what really happened because, like, Stevie got on Twitter and Stephen Stevens' aunt was, like, trashing everyone. And then he realized, oh, Hard Rock is one of my sponsors of my radio program. Oh, I want to be able to play this thing again. I mean, I don't know that's what he thought, but I'm guessing that that was sort of the chain of events based on communication. Um, it seems so silly now, but it, it, it just, people paid a lot of money for that show. It was their only show that year, and you really, you had to pull the plug. You couldn't, and, and it's not like they communicated that the show was over. Nobody came on the, the sound system and said, and that's the end of the show, because literally everyone around us thought there was a problem that they were going to fix mm -hmm. and the show would continue. Right. Right. All right, so best show. The second night in Paris, the second night in Paris. Okay. Best set list. Oh, second night in Paris. Drunkest fans. Dublin. Best crowd singing fans. Uh, you know, Paris was a very international pit and, and so you were hearing a lot of different accents singing the songs. And that was, yeah, that was definitely a lot of fun. Best sign? The best sign was uh, somebody I know from Norway who had a sign in Prague that said, Bruce, did you meet my mom in 1990? Bruce, and she was right around the front and uh, very attractive blonde, and Bruce really thought it was hysterical. That's adorable. And are you going back? Yes, we are definitely going back. Lots of rumors, lots of uh, dates slipping out, um, really hoping for... Uh, Istanbul and maybe something like Sofia. Uh, I would love to go to Eastern Europe. Prague was a lot of fun. Uh, we love to travel this way. You know, we that's not a lot of people went to Dublin because it's not hard, but it was more fun for me to go to places where they didn't speak English. Yeah. Well, it's a really fun book, you guys. Raise your hand. Karen Rose, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you.